Well, it's been a, it's been a great day so far, and uh, I hope to live up to the standard of the, uh, the previous talk. So what I'm going to do is uh, remind you that this is actually a very challenging field to be in. My sacking there, uh, 2009, originated from giving a similar lecture in London, at King's College, when I uh, commented on the, uh, the flaws in current government drug policy. Because in those days, I was the chair of the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs, and I didn't realise until I was sacked that that meant I was supposed to say what the government told me, <laughs> not what was true. And the sacking is really well summed up in this particular cartoon. Uh, there's a book of cannabis falling from my hand, and here are the scales of justice with beer and fags here and strange green chemicals here. And I was arguing, at the very least, that cannabis wasn't as harmful as beer and fags. And uh, at the time, I was pretty sure I was right. Uh, now I know I'm right because Obama came out and agreed with me. And, uh, and it's one of the great statements in, uh, in the history of American um, presidents. The first time an American president has ever told the truth about drugs. And... Uh, Maybe the first time they've ever told the truth about anything, but that's another story. <laughs> but this was a very important, very important message because Obama was saying basically we're going to stop persecuting pharmacies which are selling medical marijuana. That's a fact in America, even though it's illegal under the, the uh, that federal government, it's legal under the state government, and we're not going to have a civil war. The, the, the feds are not going to start da damaging the, uh, the access to medical marijuana. So it's an amazing statement. Because that now means that America can no longer say it has the right to control drug policy in the rest of the world. If it can't control its own states, then it really shouldn't have any undue authority over us. And over the last hundred years, American policy on drugs has largely been the international policy. So this is a, this is a fundamental change in the landscape of international drug policies, if we choose to take advantage of it. Now, You've had six talks already today, I've been through them, and I just wanted to, to briefly summarise the key elements, and then I'll try to, in the rest of my talk, fill in the gaps. So, so you heard from Fiona that testing works, and not only it works in, uh, it's not only rational and humane, but it also, as she's now got the first evidence, is it actually reduces harms by reducing hospitalisations and changing behaviour. So that, that's this extremely powerful argument in favour of testing. And I think we can all leave here saying that to deny testing would be actually inhumane and, and actually a, a dereliction of our duty and also it would, it's actually, I think the right to test is, is one of the rights we're going to have to incorporate in, into human rights legislation. Neil pointed out that policing doesn't work and he gave great examples of the violence that can come both to policemen if they're undercover and also people who end up in the drugs field. And, and it means that we we have to change police culture. And I was encouraged to hear from him that the police are now beginning to change their culture. And although I was slightly sceptical about the concept of police commissioners, I'm now beginning to see that they can have merits because they do bring a different dimension to policing. And they, and they, are often, they often come from environments where evidence has been more easily accessible and, and, and acceptable than in the police. So there is hope there. Ash told us that the Royal Pharmaceutical Society wasn't in favour currently of legalisation of cannabis or other drugs, but he shared with us this, the remarkable journey that pharmacists have been on in the last 30 years, going from essentially being barriers to treatment to being the facilitators of treatment, particularly in relation to, to uh, harm reduction programmes with, uh, with heroin. And Val reminded us the way in which cannabis has evolved in the last 30 years, and and how that evolution has been driven not by a desire by the punter particularly, but by pressures from uh, prohibition and uh, the challenge of people um, competing in a marketplace. So we've seen, in a way, with cannabis, the worst kind of free market. More bang for your buck, more, more THC, less cannabidiol, and the consequences of that are likely to be greater addiction and possibly more psychosis. Andrew? Fantastic presentation. Your first in front of a huge audience like this, and you were brilliant, I thought. And I, I, I thought it was fascinating the way you, you had adapted to the challenge of, the, uh, of Spice in Manchester as a, as a police force uh, and confronted it, and then thought through what to do. And I, I'm very impressed that what you've done is, 
actually evidence-based. And it's also not only helping you decide what to do properly, but also helping us get information about what drugs are out there and, uh, and um, what quantities and concentrations. So, fantastic. And then Tim showing us this wonderful data, sad, terrifying data, data that we always suspected was true, but we didn't really have the evidence to be sure about. Now we do know from those 200,000 heroin addicts, we know that not only do they die of overdose, but they also die of other disorders like uh, hepatitis and um, other viruses and pneumonia. And we know that they do that not just because they're taking heroin, but because they're also marginalised. They're outside the health system. And that, that they present an enormous challenge to us, part of which will be solved by encouraging and developing access to treatments like opiate substitution therapy, but not everything will be sorted out by that, and we do have to think of other approaches as well. We also have to think very carefully of uh, how we get people out of treatment and into other forms of therapy, because that massively elevated risk of overdose death in the month when you leave treatment. So I want to now fill in a few of the gaps, as I said. Um, I'm going to focus the first half of my talk on the, on the drug laws in relation to what they're supposed to achieve, reductions in harm and use. And the second part, I'll focus on the uh, topic of how they've impeded research, something that one or two of the other speakers did mention, but I want to go into it in a little bit more detail, because this is currently a major campaign of ours, so particularly in drug science, to try to bring it to the public's attention so you can help us campaign for changes in the law to make research and, and clinical therapy more available. And really, I think these are the key questions. So it's interesting when you talk about, about the law, um, you talk with lawyers about the law, you ask them you know, questions like this, they often look rather blank, as if you know, well, you, the law is something that is just a fact. You shouldn't be questioning it. But, I mean, there are, clear, there are clearly very important issues relating to the law on drugs. For instance, are they proportionate to relative harms? Is executing people in Malaysia for possessing heroin, is that, is that an appropriate response to a drug which you know, in the, is not likely to kill them? Is it, is it reasonable to put people in prison for five years for possessing MDMA when uh, riding horses can cause more harm than the drugs they're taking? I think those are really critical questions. Why do we have a disproportionate uh, hostility or fear of the harms of drugs compared with other harmful activities? And then the next question is, do the presumed benefits of the law, the presumed reduction in use and harms, do they outweigh the downsides, particularly the violence that we've heard about, the impediment to research I'm going to talk about, and the limitations of treatment, which I'm going to talk about. And then finally, the fundamental question, do the laws on drugs work at all? You've heard arguments they're not doing any, any good at all. And they may actually be creating a greater problem in terms of harms and illegality than they uh, can remotely um, have uh, benefited. But we don't formally evaluate that, and that's something that is, I think, something we have to challenge. We can't really just assume that the laws can allow, are allowed to be. They didn't come down uh, from whatever mountain they came down before. They were invented by us. And here I, you know, I list the, what I think are the six fundamental flaws in our current policy in the UK. It's biased. It doesn't distinguish some drugs from other drugs. It puts punishment above harm reduction, and that's a moral choice. The punishments are disproportionate, and I would argue, as you've heard already, others argue they do more harm than good. They severely limit treatment and research. They encourage the use of more toxic compounds, which I will elaborate on, and they waste a huge amount of money. It's, a, it's an enormously expensive business trying to, to criminalise your way out of drug, people using drugs. And I would argue, I don't suppose many of you would disagree, that the drug laws are some of the worst laws that have ever been enacted. They're, they're moral-based laws, it, which are comparable in terms of their... Uh, lack of integrity and, and uh, honesty with laws relating to slavery and to racial supremacy and male supremacy. They're not perhaps quite as bad as those in all re regards, but they're in the same category. These are, these are arbitrary laws which essentially penalise a subgroup of people that the establishment doesn't like and sees advantages in, in, in marginalising. <coughs> 
So they're very unjust. But I'm going to say more than that. I'm going to say that in terms of their impact on research, the denial of evidence that underpins the so-called, or well, that underpins the current drug laws and the war on drugs, this is the worst censorship of research in the history of science. There's never been an example where science has been so restricted based on a false premise about harms and the prevention of harms, or any other premise for that matter. Now Val asked how many of you uh, smoke cannabis. I think she said about a fifth put their hands up. If I were to do the same for alcohol, it would be 85% probably. So I think it's important we don't forget that the two big killers in terms of drug use in Britain are tobacco and alcohol. And you can see the scale. On the left-hand side, deaths from tobacco and alcohol. And then the right-hand side, the opiates magnified. And then the other drugs. So Tim explained very eloquently the, the huge challenge of opiate deaths. But they pay against the deaths from tobacco and, uh, and alcohol. Tobacco is still the leading cause of avoidable death in Britain, 80,000 premature deaths a year. They're called good deaths, though, by economists, because people who smoke pay a lot of tax, and then they die before they can actually uh, draw their pensions, so they don't live long enough to be a burden on the state. <laughs> alcohol deaths are, much, are spread much more across the age burden, uh, age, and uh, alcohol is now the leading cause of death in men under the age of 50 in this country, and it'll be the leading cause of death in women under the age of 50 with the next few years because women are drinking more than men now. So alcohol is, is a huge health problem in young people. So whenever we think about the, and worry about other drugs, we must always remember that alcohol is a drug. And that's something that came clear. This is a graph you saw uh, in a different guise uh, from Fiona. But when drug science did its uh, analysis of the harms of drugs using the, the 16 different parameters of the multi-criteria decision analysis, tool that we developed, alcohol came out as the most harmful drug in the UK. And the, the reason it's the most harmful drug in the UK is, the, say, is the, the size of the red bar. The red bar is the harm of each drug to society. And alcohol, through its enormous impact on families, on children, on health, on traffic accidents, is way the most harmful drug in the UK today. Uh, to other people. It's not the most harmful drug to the user. If you look just to the, to the right of the, in the alcohol bar, you'll see heroin, crystal meth, crack cocaine. They're more harmful to the user. The blue bar is a scale of the harm to the user. But because of the massive use of alcohol, that is still the most harmful drug in the UK overall. And that's what I was saying to the government when I was sacked, because that is not, an, that is not a fact that a government which is has a lot of uh, noses in the trough of the alcohol industry. It's not something they wanted to hear. <laughs> Having done that analysis, we then plotted this graph. We looked at the correlation between the harms of drugs and their position in the Misuse of Drugs Act or in the UN Conventions on Drugs. And there is no correlation. And that's not surprising, but it's worrying because those conventions and acts are meant to be based on <coughs> evidence of harm. And my analysis, or conclusion from that analysis, is that the current UN conventions and the UK drug laws, they are not evidence-based. And they're immoral, therefore. Because the decision of to which drug should be controlled and which shouldn't is, is essentially a moral or a political decision. It's not a health decision. And the purpose of these drugs laws is to reduce harms and improve health. They're also illegal, by the way, but unfortunately it's impossible to to take out a legal challenge against governments because they uh, always argue that they are the final source of legal decision making. So that's always failed. But the, the Misuse of Drugs Act in this country is supposed to be based on evidence, and it isn't. But I want to look at the question of what drives this dishonesty. We've had it now. The UN Convention started in 1961. Our Misuse of Drugs Act 1971. We've got 60 years of dishonesty. What's, what is driving that? What, why, do, why do we have it? Well, the actors in this dishonesty. Well, one of them is the drinks industry. The drinks industry has been working systematically over the last 150 years to eliminate all competition. In the 1880s, you could go down to your local corner shop or your pharmacy, you could buy alcohol, you could buy cannabis tincture, you could buy heroin tincture, cocaine tincture, 
they were all e easily available. Uh, and through a combination of the disinformation by various groups and the enormous power of the, uh, the temperance movement, eventually all drugs except alcohol got removed. And the alcohol industry has fought very successfully to maintain that status. Uh, and it's, uh, it's the most successful industry in the world in terms of there is no competition in this country at all. The, la the 2016 Psychoactive Substances Act made it illegal to have to use any psychoactive substance other than alcohol if you want to relax your brain. So they've, they've won, they've won that battle. But it, and it's been, a, it's been one that's been done in a very sophisticated and uh, with a huge investment in lobbying in Parliament and elsewhere. And here's an example of how they do it. So here are two people who died from taking a drug. On the left-hand side is a lad who died after a golf match. With he, he was in the Exeter University golf team. And he got in, into a drinking game after a golf match. A silly thing that many young men in sports teams do. And he died of alcohol poisoning because he failed. He lost each round of the drinking game. And the fourth feet was to drink more. So after two rounds, he drunk himself to death. Uh, on the right-hand side, there's a picture of Leah Betts. That's a billboard. Her face was stuck on billboards all over the country. And uh, the, um, it's, it says sorted. You can see it there. It says sorted. And sorted, of course, was the, uh, the term used by people who were buying pills. Shall I stop it? It might distract you. Not that one. It certainly distracts me. <laughs> Her face was stuck on billboards all over the country after she died of water poisoning. She took 80 milligrams of MDMA, the same dose as I gave to the novelist Lionel Shriver. No, I didn't actually, I think Val did. But anyway, we did, between us, we gave Lionel Shriver 80 milligrams of ecstasy in a scanner. She came out and said, that was rubbish. You should give a bigger dose. But Leah took 80 milligrams of ecstasy and drank seven litres of water and died of water poisoning. Uh, she understood that she shouldn't drink water with having taken ecstasy unless she was dancing for long periods and sweating, she wouldn't have died. But at that time, there was a, a serious concern by the drinks industry that young people were switching from alcohol to MDMA. So they put up this advert around the country trying to scare people off using this drug. They'd never tried to scare people off using alcohol, even though three young people a week die of alcohol poisoning in this country, often on their 18th birthday. The newspapers have a huge influence in this, particularly some of the newspapers. This is, this is one of my favourite headlines. I, I, <laughs> when I use it at international meetings, people often say to me, is that English? <laughs> and I say, no, it's sunnish. Um, <laughs> and it's a, it's a remarkably, it's a, it's a fictitious story as far as we know. It was just created uh, on the back of a few pints of alcohol and a couple of 50 pound notes in a bug. But uh, it serves the purpose of scaring people about this legal teen drug, which by the way was methadrone, m and I'll come back to that later on. And of course the media have a policy, they like to re hype the use of drugs, increase concerns about drugs so they can get them banned. And this is a, just a, a very classic statement. York GP David Fair said he'd seen more cases of people who'd taken methadrone recreationally since the press began its campaign. Well, it's because no one had heard about it until the press started complaining. <laughs> and that's part of the policy. You create hysteria, people start to use it, and then you've got a justification for banning it. Of course, there's a much longer tradition of scaring people about drugs, way, way before methadrone. Um, this, it actually reached its peak back in the 1960s with the desire to ban LSD. And some of the stories there are even more remarkable than <laughs> Now, what's, what's interesting about those front pages is that, although they're obviously fictitious and fanciful, the drug laws in America at the time, and our, our drug laws are the same, say if there is significant public concern over the social harms of a drug, the drug can be banned. And that, those headlines were taken as su sufficient public concern because if an editor of a newspaper is concerned, they must be representative of the public. 
And it was those data, or those, those you know, creations, which actually justified the banning of LSD, which I'll come back to in a minute. But of course, the truth is that the drug laws are largely driven by politicians, and I think it's very really important that you all read this statement from John Ehrlichman, who was explaining why Nixon created the war on drugs. The 1968 Nixon campaign had two enemies, the anti-war left, that's the anti-Vietnam War, and black people. We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. That is what they did. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. So this was just a political campaign, cynical political campaign, which created enormous havoc in those communities, just so that uh, Nixon could be re-elected. And it wasn't just Ehrlichman and Nixon. We did the same thing in Britain. The Labour government in Britain in the 2000s decided to crack down on cannabis users because it thought it would be politically expedient so to do and give them some advantage in the election. So this is actually what happened. Here's Gordon Brown on his happier days. And, um, <laughs> Gordon Brown, when he was leader of the Labour Party, had an off-the-record illegal meeting with Paul Dacre, the editor of the Daily Mail, when he asked Paul Dacre if he would support him, the Mail would support Labour in the next election. It was an absurd question. I mean, the Mail has, you know, the Mail supported Hitler. It's very unlikely to support, uh, support Stalin, but... Um, no, that was a joke, sorry. <laughs> Gordon was not that bad, but... Um, so. Anyway, he went, he met, and apparently Dacre said to him, yes, the male will support you in the next election. If you do three things, you've got to reduce the top rate of income tax from 50% to 45%. Check. The Labour Party did that within weeks. You've got to put a cap on immigration of 200,000 a year. Check. Gordon did that. And you've got to reclassify cannabis. Check. And Gordon did that. And the Labour Party reclassified cannabis and, and carried on this campaign of arresting young people for cannabis possession. Because they thought if they showed they were hard on drugs, they would get elected. They didn't get elected. One of the reasons they didn't get elected was because the Daily Mail reneged on its promise. As you might have imagined, it didn't support Labour. It could never support Labour. It's not, it's not in its blood. But he sold the soul of the Labour Party and used prosecution of young people on, for drugs as part of the, the sale. Now we have a million young people in this country with criminal convictions for possessing cannabis. It undermines their life opportunities, but it also undermines their belief in justice. Getting arrested for having a bit of cannabis in your pocket by a policeman who you know is going to drink more dangerous amounts of alcohol that night than the cannabis you have is unjust, and young people know that. And it's also racist. There was a three to four fold increase in um, ethnic minorities be being convicted. So not only do we have an underclass, we have an underclass that also has racial um, uh, dissent and dis dissatisfaction underpinning the, uh, the dissatisfaction with the drug laws, which is a bad uh, and unnecessary combination. And it fills our prisons. One of, the, one of the very few countries in the world that's actually increasing our prison population, building new prisons. In the Netherlands, they've halved their prison population because they don't put people in prison for drugs, but we do. All the increase in our prison population, gone back to the mid-90s, has been driven by putting people in prison for drug offences, which is absurd. Not, not just economically absurd, but also, of course, therapeutically absurd because many people are introduced to hard drugs like heroin in prison. So we actually compound the problem. We lock them up. We pay £40,000 a year to lock them up. And then they take more drugs in prison. I mean, how, how ridiculous a policy is that? And then there's the multiple examples of how prohibition leads to more harm. You go back to 1910, with the Hague Convention, when they banned smoking opium. What do people do? Oh, well, if you can't smoke opium, you'll inject heroin. It's much harder to detect. You might have learned by then, you think you might have actually begun to learn that, that perhaps banning drugs which aren't particularly harmful could lead to perverse consequences as people hunt for more potent 
less detectable alternatives. So we've got cannabis with synthetics, we've got cocaine and crack, we've got MDMA and PMA, LSD and psilocybin with the M-bombs, and heroin now with the synthetics, uh, particularly the fentanyls. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of that. But in all these cases, the consequences of the ban have led to drugs which are more dangerous, more harmful, and more deadly. So several of the speakers have talked about the rise of synthetic cannabinoids. They exist because we decided to start testing people for cannabis. Why did we do that? We did it because we like to punish people, because the British way of doing the law is, rather than prevent harm, to um, create criminals and then punish them more. It's, it's all part of the sort of public school, you know, cold showers and beatings mentality, which pervades Parliament still. And that's what we did it. There was no rationale for testing for cannabis other than to punish people. We did it. Sensible people, like prisoners, decided they start finding stuff you couldn't test for, and there's a lot of them out there. You know, here, some of, here are some of the examples of the multiple different derivatives that you can make of cannabis structures to make synthetic cannabinoids. There's hundreds of them, there's thousands of them, there's probably an infinite number if you really want to. And we've seen outbreaks not just in Manchester and New York had the, had the outbreak of Fubaneca and, uh, and as, as did Manchester last year, we've heard about that. And I had to change this slide because you, I had it 75%. You told me it was 90%. So it's now 90% of prisoners <coughs> using spice. They didn't hurt, they'd never heard of spice until people started selling the spice as a way of avoiding detection for cannabis. Prisoners are not stupid. If you're going to lose a couple of years uh, off your sentence because uh, you, you test positive for cannabis and you know that cannabis is the easiest thing to test for, you're going to find some drugs to take which they don't test for or at least are cleared from the system quicker. And that's why they started using spice. And the potency of spice and the ability of, get to, of spice to be taken into prisons in surreptitious ways, in letters, in, in, in soaked in hand, handkerchiefs, soaked in dried of spice, with spice liquid, means that we now estimate about 5% of our prison officers are now drug dealers. And that, you know, that's, again, it's a sad commentary on the, the problem, or the way we've been dealing with the problem, but it's also, it's totally predictable. You know, if there are, as Neil pointed out, when you create a huge market, people, it will corrupt the police, it will corrupt prison officers. But what we haven't heard of today is what the government did. It did two things. Well, the first thing it did, it tried to control all synthetic cannabinoids under the Misuse of Drugs Act. And he started making new so-called third-generation cannabinoid legislation. And uh, because they don't like me and my committee, because we tell them the truth, they, they didn't tell us what they were doing, but they, we discovered what they were trying to do. And the Drug Science Committee contains Britain's, pretty much all Britain's experts on cannabis pharmacology, people that actually wrote the original laws. And when we saw what we were trying to do, we were horrified because we realised that the, what they were doing, the drugs that they were going to ban, weren't just synthetic cannabinoids, but they were drugs like indomethacine and candesartan. Because they hadn't realised that very many drugs are actually uh, come from the same structures as these synthetic cannabinoids. Oh, so he said, okay, so when the law came out, they actually exempted 27 substances that they knew of. But then they forgot that actually when you're making new drugs, you start from precursors that aren't drugs, but which are chemicals which fall under the, the control of the third generation cannabis agencies. And now we estimate that there are 100,000 research chemicals in the pharma industry in Britain which are now illegal under this new legislation. And it's actually, the industry is, in, is in, up in arms about this because it essentially means that everything they do is illegal. And the government, they don't understand that because because our laws are made by people who are essentially with respect policemen they're not scientists they're, actually when they're the first when they try to control things under the psychoactive substances at the first reading of the psychoactive substances bill it didn't mention research and we complained to the home office and they said well you know we're trying to stop people using drugs we know do we really care about research well now there, there is an exemption for research but the fact is that these drug policies are so blinkered in favour of prohibition and punishment that they lose sight of the bigger picture. And the other thing, this really I find very, very upsetting, they also banned the only available antidote to spice. So this is an absurd situation. We are trying to find an antidote to spice so that you don't 
you know, have to send these special teams into prison so that when people are going psychotic or having seizures and spliced. But the government has banned the only possible antidote, just in case it's psychoactive. It's an absurdity, but it's because the hysteria about psychoactivity has completely dwarfed the need for medicine. And uh, it's impossible to have a dialogue with them about it. Here's another example. You may have seen this drug, PMA or PMMA, mentioned a couple of times recently. Um, you may wonder what it is. Well, it's, a, it's an amphetamine analogue that's been around for a long time. It was actually, these drugs were made illegal under the 1971 UN Conventions on, on Synthetic Narcotics. And here you see the number of deaths in Britain going back to the early 90s. Very, very few deaths. And then a big rise in deaths around 2008, 2009. Why that? Well, the reason for that was the UN attempt to stop the production of ecstasy. And MDMA and PMA are rather similar. You know, for those of you, you can see there's, uh, there's just one extra oxygen on MDMA. Well, there's plenty of oxygen in the air, isn't it? So it's not a big difference. Is it? MDMA is made from saffron, which is produced from sassafras oil. And uh, until 2008, almost all sassafras oil was extracted from plants, particularly in tropical regions like Thailand. And it converted to MDMA through a process which is pretty simple, really. The United Nations were angry that young people continuing to use MDMA despite the fact it was made illegal. So they tried to stop the production. So in 1998, they banned the production of saffron. And not much happened until 2000 and, uh, 2008, when a massive seizure occurred in Thailand. They seized 50 tonnes. That's a lot of saffron. Half the world supply in one seizure. And they celebrated it. Front page of the UN News, we have broken the back of the MDMA trade. They cannot get the precursor. You know, they thought, they thought job done. No precursor no MDMA. And at one level, that was right. At one level, there was a massive, you saw from uh, Fiona's presentation, there was a big dip in the availability and the, um, the purity of MDMA at that time, because they did. They actually made it very hard to make MDMA. But if you're an illegal chemist in Shanghai, and you got an order for a kilo of ecstasy next month, and someone says, I'm sorry, I can't get you the saffron. You don't put your hand up and say, oh, well, that's all right, I'll make it antibiotic this month instead. No. <laughs> what you do is say, I've got uh, two weeks to make something that I can sell as MDMA or ecstasy. Because actually, ecstasy is just a word. It doesn't mean it's MDMA. And so they just hunted around for an oil they could use. It wasn't saffron. And they found anethol, which is aniseed oil. Now, aniseed oil is in... I bet every one of you is wearing something with aniseed oil in it. It's a vital ingredient of cosmetics, perfumes, foodstuffs. It's, it, it lubricates so much international trade, it has to stay legal. So they just bought anethol, put it through the same chemical process as they previously used to make MDMA, but it doesn't make MDMA, it makes PMA or PMMA, depending on the chemical reaction. And these are not typical stimulants. They have a slow onset of action, so people take one, they take 50 milligrams, say, or 100 milligrams, they think, Nothing's happening. This must be another crap dose of MDMA, like I had, or ecstasy I had the week before. So then they take two tablets to get a bigger dose in. And by the time the three tablets have got in their brain, they've blocked all the monoamine oxidase in the brain, the enzyme that breaks down serotonin. They've caused a massive release of serotonin because this drug, these drugs release serotonin. And so they get the serotonin syndrome, hypothermia, brain damage, and they die. So those PMA deaths are all utterly the consequence uh, of the banning of saffron. So we, we produce a much more toxic substance. And it's considerably more toxic. Some of you won't, probably none of you will have seen this data. It's only really in the last month been published. Um, and it's still only online. It hasn't come in the hard copy. But these are estimates of the toxicity of drugs done by two experts, uh, Les King and John Corkery. And uh, these scale different drugs. And Tim will be pleased to know that heroin is still very much the most dangerous drug and cannabis actually has no danger at all, according in terms of mortality. But here you see MDMA versus PMA, and these are log scales. So PMA is at least 
are around about 10 times more toxic than MDMA. So the policy of trying to stop people having access to MDMA has led them to use the drug um, that is more toxic. Now we've had loads of deaths from PMA and PMMA in Britain. But now we don't have any because Tim showed you the data last year, they've gone. Why have those deaths gone? Because the Chinese chemists aren't stupid. When they realised that actually extracting saffron from sassafras plants in Vietnam wasn't a sensible thing to do, they just started manufacturing saffron. And now we have hundreds of thousands of tonnes of saffron, and that's why our MDMA tablets have gone up in strength from 40 milligrams to 100 milligrams, because it's so much cheaper now. We've, they've basically scaled up the production. You don't have to get it from plant material, so you can make stronger tablets. So at two levels, that policy has been very damaging. It's killed people through PMA, and it's now opened up a much bigger market in terms of strength, super strength MDMA. But there's another drug on here I want to come back to. I mentioned methadone already. Now, on this scale of harms, methadone is uh, two log units less harmful than MDMA. It's down around, uh, well, some of the other synthetic cathinones, piperazines, etc. Not a very harmful drug. So why do we make it illegal? Well, we made it illegal because legal teen drugs ripped his scrotum off, wasn't it? Was it? Legal drug team ripped his scrotum off. Because there was hysteria in the media about methadrone. But when you look at what happened when methadrone became available, you see a very interesting profile. And this, I think, is one of the most remarkable natural experiments in the history of recreational use of drugs. So what you're looking at here are deaths in the black line from cocaine each year and in the red line deaths from amphetamines each year. And methadrone became available in about 2008 on the internet. And it, it was a legal drug, it wasn't controlled under the Misuse of Drugs Act, and it's being sold in one gram quantities, uh, and a gram wasn't killing people. So people were switching. They were switching from cocaine and amphetamine to methadrone. And you see the number of deaths from cocaine fell precipitously, and the number of deaths from amphetamines fell to about half. So although methadrone didn't kill anyone, it probably saved about 400 deaths from other drugs. But it had to be banned. The election was coming up. Alan Johnson wanted to appease voters. So they banned methadrone. And after a year, when the stockpiles were used up, cocaine deaths have reached an all-time high, as have amphetamine deaths. And that, I would argue, is perfect proof of how the drug-using population actually would like safer drugs. And when they had one, they used it. But if everything's illegal, well, you may as well just go back to cocaine, because it's more fun, even if it's more dangerous. And I want to, just the last few minutes, I want to talk about the science. And the, uh, this is a, a great cartoon from uh, Dilbert. I need three bitter and unsuccessful scientists and a hundred lazy journalists. And Ratbert says, very good. And the next day Dilbert reads, did you know that toddlers thrive on pollution? <laughs> and if you get the right journalists and the right scientists in the room, you can find all sorts of interesting scientific facts. <laughs> Ecstasy causes brain damage, cannabis causes schizophrenia. LSD makes you mad. Even you can find our drug laws at work, and that's actually a hard one to find. <laughs> there are very few journalists that believe that. And as I've said before, the science underpinning the drug laws is the worst science ever. Scientists do not tell the truth. Many scientists are not even allowed to, they aren't, they aren't even allowed to research the truth about the drug laws in America. They're not allowed to do studies which might suggest that the US drug laws aren't working. You can only do studies that show that drugs are harmful. And perhaps the most outrageous case is the case of the banning of psychedelics. So psychedelics were banned in 1967 because they were changing the way young Americans voted. They were voting against the war in Vietnam. And that was potentially undermining the whole American way of, of existing, in, and certainly their economic base. And here's Bobby Kennedy, the most powerful man in the world. He's Secretary of State. He would have been President if he hadn't been assassinated. And his bureaucrats are saying, we've got to ban LSD. And he's saying, why? If these projects were worthwhile six months ago, why aren't they worthwhile now? Up to that point, NIH had funded 140 grants to study LSD. 40,000 patients have been studied. And now he's being told it was all worthless. We keep on going around and around. If I could get a flat answer about that, I'd be happy. Is there a misunderstanding about the question? He knew he was being lied to. He knew that the, those bureaucrats, the feds who wanted to ban drugs, wanted to ban this for no good reason other than they wanted to ban it. 
because they didn't like the effect it was having, not that it was not. And they were saying it wasn't useful, even though he knew it was useful. I think perhaps we've lost sight of the fact that LSD can be very, very helpful in our society if used properly. And since then, the US government has funded not a single study on a psychedelic. <coughs> So 140 up to 1967, not a single one since. Our government has only funded one in the last 50 years, and that was our depression study. I'll tell you about it in a second. And I think it's the worst censorship of research since the banning of the telescope in 1616. Now, that was, the banning of both are the same. They're both, they're both those laws are enacted because the science was changing the way people thought about the world. Copernicus had discovered that the sun was the center of the universe. The Catholic Church didn't like that. So for 150 years, you couldn't read his books if you were a Catholic. But there weren't that many astronomers, and even in the Northern Europe, the Protestants could carry on looking at the sky. So although it was a long ban, it wasn't, uh, didn't stop a lot of science. The ban of researching drugs like psychedelics and cannabis has been going for 50 years. <coughs> the area under the curve of research in these 50 years is enormous because of the advances in technology like imaging. And there's no sign it's ending. Well, as you probably know, the overturning of the Catholic Church's hegemony on science came from the Enlightenment. It came from people who were great scientists who said, you know, we will do science, irregardless of what the Church says. And of course, the great voice of the Enlightenment was Voltaire. And he said, as you can see here, prejudices are what fools use for reason. And that is, I would say, that is exactly how the drug laws in this country and the United Nations and the USA have been built. They're built on prejudice. They're not built on evidence. What's worse is that many of the drugs we have banned were actually medicines. Val showed you that cannabis was a medicine for three and a half thousand years. Ecstasy, psilocybin, and LSD were all being used medicinally before they were banned. But now they're told they don't have medical value. They're Schedule One drugs. Huh? And I just think it's really important that you know the disinformation that permeates the very highest levels of decision making in the world about this. So this is the WHO. The, you, know, you, you imagine the WHO is this great acme of intellect and honesty. <coughs> the last time there was an international review of the health benefits of cannabis was in 1934. Before the WHO was founded, they haven't reviewed it since. That ban removed it in most countries in 1934. In Britain, we held on to 1971, where we eventually caved into American pressure and we took it out of our pharmacopoeia when we made the, Med uh, the Misuse of Drugs Act into law. And they've never reviewed this. The WHO have never reviewed this because they say they have lack of resources. We now know that 18 countries have reviewed it and said that, that cannabis is a medicine. In fact, in Germany, they've now said that there are 57 indications which insurance companies must reimburse cannabis medicine for. And the Germans are pretty, pretty good doctors, you know. We went to WHO in November 2016 and we presented them with a report. They said they couldn't, didn't have the resources. In the last 84 years, they'd never had the resources to review cannabis. So we did it for them. We we did a report for them, according to all their standards, everything they needed to have a report on cannabis. And we went along, and, uh, and they didn't like it. They did not like it at all. There's the report, the drug science report. And they refused to read it, because we hadn't submitted it through the approved process, which meant they had to put out a tender, and, uh, and we had to bid. What was remarkable, while we were there, we said, well, could we look at the original 1934 report, please, to see what it said? And they said, we couldn't do that because they'd lost it. <laughs> so now the whole international control that says cannabis is not a medicine is based on an 80-year-old piece of paper they've lost. <laughs> well, it's, it's kind of chilling to, to, to see how low the sort of intellectual level has sunk. And as I said, many other drugs are medicines. And the current regulations, as Val mentioned, the Schedule 1 regulations are, are a self-perpetuating failure. Drugs are, are put in Schedule 1. It says they have no medical value. 
Uh, but they're very dangerous, so you can't study them to prove they've got a medical value. So there's a kind of logic to it. People don't want to know the truth. They don't want to be proved to be wrong, so they keep them there. And when you talk to the people who know about the UN, they say the UN conventions do not ban research. You can do research if you want. The problem is, in practice, they censor research. And this is proof. So here's a recent paper that came out a few months ago, looking at the number of publications on LSD in blue, and another psychedelic psilocybin in red. LSD discovered here, massive interest, all those 140 different NIH grants produce lots of papers. It gets banned, and then the number of publications pretty much disappears. Uh, for psilocybin. Psilocybin was a medicine here for about four years. And in one year there were no... That is proof of censorship. If the governments won't fund, you can't do research. If, if it takes years and years to get permissions, you can't do research. We got a grant from the Medical Research Council to do a study of psilocybin in resistant depression. I was surprised to get it, but delighted to get it, because this is the first government funding in this country ever, I think, of a, a psilocybin study. But getting the grant was easy. It took a year and three iterations to get permission to use it in patients. They said it was too dangerous. And I said, well, a thousand... Sorry, a million people a year in Britain take it, and no one's ever died. And they said, yeah, but that's not depressed people. And in the end, they wouldn't let us do, even though it was a medicine back in the 1960s, they wouldn't let us do a controlled study. We had to do a safety study. We had to give it to depressed people in one dose and wait for six months to make sure they didn't die. And then if they were alive at six months, we could then have, they were competent, it was safe enough to do a controlled study. So it was truly, that was a kind of surreal interaction with an ethics committee. But that, again, that was the easy bit. It took us 30 months to find a supplier in the world because working with these illegal drugs is hugely costly. Most companies who make drugs don't want to do it. There's nothing in it for them. It's too expensive to comply with the regulations. And then it took another two months to get regulatory permission. So 32 of the 36 months of the grant were spent getting the drug. The drug cost £1,500 a dose. I had to have a special police check. I have to have a special fridge, a safe, into which to put, I put my side of side in. I'm a doctor, I can write a prescription for heroin, but I have to have a special check and a special safe for my psilocybin. Why? Well, in case you're going to deal it down the streets. <laughs> I say, not even in Chelsea, you're going to get £1,500 a dose of psilocybin. I mean, I'm... <laughs> but I am treated like a drug dealer because this drug is defined as having no medical use and being a very dangerous drug. Well, I mean, it is, it is absurd. And if you want to read more about it, well, here's some papers I've written about it that give you the background, the history, and uh, the absurdities. Well, I promise I'll give you some solutions. Here are, here are a few solutions that I think we should all be championing in, in, uh, as we take the messages from today outside of this particular meeting. We need a Royal Commission. We need to review the drug laws. They are clearly way not fit for purpose. They've got worse and worse over the years. They failed to deliver the uh, harm reduction, the the use reduction that they're claimed to do. And we need to do something fundamental. We need to be honest and just like countries like Norway are doing it present. We've got to put prior medicines. If it was a medicine, it should be back in Schedule 2. Governments have no right to take medicines out of medicine, simply in an attempt to stop recreational use. Even if they were stopping recreational use by doing this, that wouldn't be justification. But they're not. There's no change in recreational use of psychedelics. Except, but there is no use of them in medicine. So it's a double loss. We should decriminalise personal possession of all drugs like Portugal has done. In the last 15 years, deaths from heroin in Portugal have reduced to one third of what they were before because people are treated humanely and they get therapy if they are caught in possession of heroin. In Britain, deaths from heroin have gone up by a third in the same 15 years because we treat them as criminals. We should liberate and fund drug testing services like the Loop are doing. That is, you know, truly the uh, 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 that's an uh, un, un obvious and um, hopefully un, you know, uncontroversial way of helping people reduce harms to themselves and others. And I also think we should just go ahead and legalise cannabis. The Lib Dems have put that into their <coughs> policy. It, it will make a lot of sense for very many reasons, not least for medical cannabis, but also it will also help reduce the massive harms of alcohol. In our And if we don't do these things, then the future, I think, is going to look even more bleak than it might look to you today. 
And this is a, a sad story, but I suspect this is just the beginning of a very unpleasant path to a very deadly future. So here's young Robert. He's in Kent. He goes out to score some cannabis from his dealer. And the cannabis says, I've got some nice E. Would you like that? And he says, yes, I would. And he buys his E. But it's fentanyl, and he's dead. Now, I, we don't know if the dealer knew it was fentanyl. But certainly, Robert didn't. And the rise of fentanyl is a terrifying spectre. So now the government are reviewing all the heroin deaths from last year, because it turns out there were probably a lot of them were due to fentanyl that wasn't detected for, because people didn't know there were 40. I didn't know there were 40 different fentanyls you could even make, let alone have been <coughs> discovered. There's over 70 fentanyls you can make. Fentanyls are cheap, toxic. Some of them are extraordinarily toxic, a thousand times more potent than heroin. Impossible to weigh out safely. And the, his, the, the way we have tried to constrain access to heroin has led to this massive growth in fentanyls in the States. That will come to this country, it has come to this country. If we don't test, we'll have very, very many more deaths like that. Thank you very much.